All right, welcome. Great to see you. Thank you for your prayers this morning for us as we went over to Emmanuel, the minister there. Take your Bibles to John 6. John 6, Pastor Ivan is down in Cambridge, so we miss him. And I missed the grand finale of 1 Kings. I was kind of bumming about that. Looking forward to Ephesians next week. I uh, discovered the preaching library of Martin Lloyd-Jones this last week. It's really good. Really good to hear that old British doctor preach. And, and I was rooting around it, and I saw 109 messages on the Gospel of John. I thought, oh, awesome. And I checked it out, and they're all from chapter 1. Every last one of them. So if you think I'm slow, wow. But he does have a series on spiritual depression that is entirely worth its weight in gold. And uh, I must have listened to 10 of them this week. It's a 24-part series. So check it out. Monergism uh, is the website. John 6. Here we are in verse 41. Therefore the Jews were grumbling about him, Jesus, because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. And they were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? And Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And now, Father, help us in these ensuing moments to be enwrapped in the glory of our dear Lord Jesus. Help us not to be like those who grumble, but rather like those who worship. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 6 begins with seekers, crowds chasing Jesus for the thrill of witnessing miracles and then the uh, joy of free food. But things are beginning to turn and the seekers are becoming grumblers. And you see that in verse 41. They've chased Jesus around the lake. They've asked for free breakfast. Jesus has turned them down. He said, I will give you the bread of life. I'll give you myself. And they don't really want that. Breakfast is not forthcoming. And so the conversation begins to turn. <clears throat> Here's what we're going to do tonight. I'm just going to work through how Jesus handles the seekers who become grumblers. We're going to look at we're going to expound unbelief, and then we are going to expound something of the wonder of the deity of Christ. And hopefully it'll make sense in your mind by the time we're done why those two things uh, are here together. Here's, here's unbelief expressed. We're going to expound unbelief in verse 41 through the first half of 44. And it's expressed in verse 41 and 42. The Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I've come down out of heaven? Unbelief. They could not believe. And what they could not believe was in doctrinal terms or theological terms, the deity of Christ. They were grumbling because Jesus said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. Now the Jews here understand this. If it is true that Jesus came down from heaven, the implications of that truth are enormous. 
Because here you have, in the person of Jesus, if Jesus is telling the truth, a unique, physical, long-term invasion of the divine into the physical realm. God taking on flesh. If Jesus indeed came from heaven, then any understanding of reality, or if you want a different word, any sort of worldview has to take the person of Jesus into account. Just like uh, any worldview or any understanding of reality has to take the law of gravity into account. If it's only true, as the History Channel likes to suggest about every week, that, that Jesus' followers only thought he was God, or perhaps his skill as a teacher, or his ability to perform miracles endeared him to large crowds, if that's the case, we could pretty much ignore Jesus and just go about our business however we desire. But if Jesus actually came down from heaven, that reality opens for us an insight into a reality that cannot be ignored. It, it affects how we answer these big questions. You know the big questions of life. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? Uh, you need to answer those questions in your own heart. You ask those, you need to answer them. And, and the reality of Jesus speaks to these questions with the authority of one who has been behind the scenes of creation, if you will. Jesus, as him who descended from heaven, is, is God. He is uncreated. He exists outside of creation. He is every bit as real as the physical realm and more so. Humanity understands, by and large, that there's more to life than just the material world, even in our secular American society, in which, at least in the public sphere, uh, there's, there's uh, an understanding that it's the physical realm that is king in the public sphere. Uh, and so you send your kids off to school, and they're taught that there is no God, that all is just physical, and uh, there's nothing that exists outside of atomic particles arranged in whatever sort of way. But even, even though that is uh, what is set forth in the public sphere, uh, the majority of people, even in a society like that, even the majority of Americans understand that there's more to life, there's more to reality than just the arrangement of atomic particles. Uh, because we understand that a purely physical universe is ultimately pointless. Um, life has no meaning of any real value. It ultimately has no purpose. Hedonism is the order of the day. Um, after preaching this morning, uh, someone invited us over for lunch, but they hadn't yet purchased lunch, so we were just kind of killing time. So we didn't arrive at their house too much before they did, because that's kind of weird, you know, to, be sitting in someone's driveway saying, where's lunch when they're not there? So in order to do so, I took a swing through a cemetery, a cemetery uh, by Mora, and uh, just to drive through and see the stones of, of people that have died and people that I didn't know. And, and there's all sorts of thoughts that go through your mind. And one of the things that goes through, through my mind is if there is no Christ, life is worthless. You just wind up here and what's the point? of it all anyway. When Jesus comes with this claim to be from the spiritual realm, verse 41, I am the bread that came down of, out of heaven. That's how they summarize and, and quote Jesus, and it's fair enough. When Jesus it claims, in fact, to be the God who created all things, who sustains all things, and for whom all things exist, the human heart, even though it recognizes that the spiritual realm exists, even though it wishes to know something about that spiritual realm, when Jesus comes and says, I am the God who created all this, the human heart hesitates. Yeah, there's comfort in knowing that there's something or someone beyond this physical realm, but we're just not so sure we want it to be Jesus. Jesus demands holiness, and we're not holy. He demands worship. He demands loyalty. He demands all the things we'd rather just keep for ourselves. 
rather than give to Him. And so our sin nature recoils at the thought of God as He is. We much prefer the idea of a God who is who we want Him to be. And so unbelief cannot receive the truth of the deity of Christ. They were grumbling about Him because He said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. But not only can it not receive the deity of Christ, we also see the rationale of unbelief. You see this in verse 42. You see the unbelief, or the rationale of unbelief. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? That is to say, unbelief in Jesus, the refusal to believe in Jesus, explains itself, it justifies its own existence. It takes a limited number of facts and a couple of wrong ones and comes up with this very confident, very bold, and very wrong solution. Notice, notice in verse 42, they take a couple of facts. This is Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know. They knew Joseph, who was probably dead by this point. They know Mary. But they got some wrong facts in there. Joseph is not Jesus' father. Jesus was born of a virgin, and they take some of the facts that they know, some of the ones they don't know, and they come up with a very wrong, though they're very confident about their incorrect solution. You see this again, by the way, in chapter 7, verse 41, just a couple of pages over. Begin in verse 40 in John 7. Some of the people, when they heard what Jesus was saying, were saying, this certainly is the prophet. And others were saying, this is the Christ. Still others were saying, surely, the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? Oh, this can't be Jesus. Jesus comes from Bethlehem. And, of course, a little bit of investigative reporting would have turned up the not very secret nugget that Jesus was indeed born from Bethlehem, but they took some of the facts and mixed in some wrong ones and came up with a solution that Jesus could not be who he claimed he was. And this is the nature of unbelief. It, it rationalizes itself and it uses facts, some good, some bad, and comes up with a very confident and very wrong solution. Now Jesus is going to explain unbelief in verse 43 and 44. So we're expounding unbelief. We see it expressed, verse 41, verse 42. And then we see it explained by Jesus in verse 43 and 44. The first thing Jesus does is helps us understand that belief keeps company. Belief keeps company. Jesus answered, verse 43, Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. Genuine belief in Jesus has always been the minority position. Even in the face of overwhelming evidence for the person of Christ, the existence of God, the reliability of the Bible, all the fine work that apologists do, and scholars, and they put all these things together and help Help us know that this is indeed true. We can rely on this. Yet, belief in Christ has always been the minority position, and unbelief will prop itself up through the unbelief of others. Uh, that is to say, uh, since it's the minority position, not many wish to hold the minority position because everybody knows that Jesus could not be from heaven. And so you see unbelief propping itself up here in verse 43 as these people grumble amongst themselves. But far more importantly, I think, is the insurmountable power of unbelief. The insurmountable power of unbelief. And this is in verse 44, one of these stunning verses of the New Testament that if it were not written here, we probably would not have come up with it ourselves. Here's the question, how does Jesus propose to overcome belief? If it's true that there is no eternal life apart from the Lord Jesus, how is he going to overcome their belief? There's no eternal life apart from believing in Jesus. How do we overcome that? There, there must be some, perhaps, method 
uh, that would speak to the culture of the day. There must be some way to convince people of his reality, his power, his love. Maybe, maybe if he's extra relevant or extra friendly or extra generous, he will overcome this unbelief. And, and all these things, by the way, are well and good in their own right. We shouldn't discount the uh, the value of apologetics. We shouldn't discount the value of ministering common grace to people. We shouldn't think that since no man is saved by a church being relevant, therefore we should try to be irrelevant. That's, uh, that's not something we can support in the text here. But John really emphasizes the divine initiative in salvation. And, and why does he do that? Because John, more than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, really emphasizes the divine initiative of salvation. And, and we would ask, why, why does John do this? John is writing at the end of the first century. Uh, the church is, Paul is gone. Peter is gone, perhaps for 20 years. The other apostles are gone. John is at the sunset of his ministry. The church is under... Uh, about to be under tremendous persecution from the Roman Emperor Diocletian. It's going to be an institutionalized persecution. It's going to be very difficult. And I think John is trying to help the church at the dawn of the second century make some sense of the fact that they are offering eternal life through Christ. And most people don't want it. You know, if we were to, and I've thought about doing this, I just can't afford it, but just as a matter of illustration, I've thought about offering a $100 bill to everyone who would attend a church service and see what sort of attendance would show up. I imagine the place would be pretty packed. And yet the church offers eternal life, no fear of death, forgiveness of sins, a glorified body that will never wear out, never grow old, a body that exceeds our current capacities a thousand times over, all this without cost, through Christ. And by and large, all we get are these great big hippopotamus yawns. Who really cares? Why is that? Why is it that people will flock for a hundred bucks and turn their back on eternal life? Many of you know the fervor of a new believer who has escaped the wrath of God and is enjoying the love of God in Christ, enjoying the forgiveness of sins, and it's struck you so tremendously with its reality that you've shared the glories of Christ with all the enthusiasm of one who has just discovered eternal life, only to be met with cold stares and, and blank looks or even hostility or a suspicion that you've lost your mind. Why is that? What do we make of that? The gospel is true, after all. Well, think about this. You remember, was it three, four, five years ago when the, the gospel of the low-carb diet swept through our nation? You could go to McDonald's and get a low-carb Big Mac, which is just a Big Mac without the bun. But, but people wanted that because we had the gospel of the low-carb diet, the gospel of sexual freedom of expression is sweeping through our nation now. The gospel of socialism is taking hold, and all of these things are being embraced by our culture. Why is the gospel of Christ so ignored, so maligned? Or, to go back to the text, why is it that the crowd wants to make Jesus the king the day before they start grumbling? And then in a year from now, they're going to crucify him when Jesus is offering eternal life. We could ask, how does Jesus make sense of this? How do you make sense of the fact, Jesus, that, that you're offering eternal life and nobody wants it? What's the problem? The problem is not the gospel. The problem is not even the one bringing the gospel. Who could bring it better than Christ? The problem is the insurmountable power of unbelief. It is impossible for anyone to believe in the Lord Jesus, Jesus says in verse 44, with this exception, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now this opens up a ton of questions and we don't have time to spend too much time here, but 
at least we should ask or will ask, is that even fair? How can God expect anyone to believe in Jesus if they're unable to do so? Or how could God condemn those who are unable to comply with his command to believe in Jesus? He says believe in Jesus, and he also says it's impossible for you to do so. One illustration that's helped me out in this regard is that of a policeman who sees a car weaving up and down the road and suspects that perhaps the driver is a little tipsy and so he will pull the car over and he will set the driver on a straight line and say walk this line and of course the drunk cannot do so and we would ask is a policeman able to condemn a drunkard for being unable to walk in a straight line is it even fair to ask him to do something which he is unable to do? Or is it that, that his inability to walk that straight line actually condemns him? And really, a man's inability to believe in Christ only serves to prove his own sinfulness, and it serves to prove the devastating effects of sin. Sin within destroys our ability to believe in Jesus. But is unbelief ultimately insurmountable? Well, not really, because unbelief is defeated in verse 44 and 45. And here's, here's how that happens. In the second half of verse 44, this happens through the irresistible drawing of the Father. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now the question is this, theologically, does the Father draw everyone, or does he draw only some? Here's, here's how these arguments play out. If, because if he draws everyone, that drawing that the Father does is clearly not always effective. So if he's drawing everyone, he's failing most of the time. And that would leave us figuring out what it takes to finish the job. In other words, God gets, sort of gets the ball rolling and he makes it at least not impossible to believe. But how do we knock down those final obstacles? And that's where methodology and emotional manipulation or even what I would call a, a measurable finish line comes into play. In other words, if no one can come to the Father except he draws him, so God draws everybody most of the way, we just have to figure out how far exactly we have to finish drawing other people, and usually that comes down to pray this prayer. Here's the finish line. God got you here. He got the ball rolling, and so uh, we're going to get some heavy preaching and manipulative music, and if you pray this prayer, yeah, you're over. You're in. The drawing is now complete. The assumption is made that God is drawing everyone, so we just have to cooperate with God and with the unbeliever to finish the job of conquering unbelief. On the other hand, if God draws some, he always succeeds in drawing. And I think that's what you get from, uh, that's the sense you get from verse 37, when Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And, and we could say, why will they come to you? They'll come to you because they're drawn to you by the Father. And, and if God draws some, always effectively, it does leave us with uncertainty as to who is going to be drawn to Christ. We don't know. But we have an absolute assurance that some will believe, and we have absolutely no doubt as to where that belief comes from. Leon Morris uh, suggests that this word draw, and a lot of this hinges on what is meant by the word draw. What does it mean that the Father draws? He suggests that that word always has reference to resistance, and that resistance is always effectively overcome. So the Father meets the resistance of unbelief, and he effectively overcomes that resistance. And all who are drawn by the Father, Jesus said, I will raise him up on the last day. So those who come to Christ have been drawn by the Father, and Christ will 
raise them. And that leads in verse 45 to the inevitable worship of the Lord Jesus. Verse 45 is in some ways saying the same thing. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. That means that those who do not come to Christ have not heard and learned from the Father. They are stuck in their unbelief. But all who have been drawn by the Father, or all who have heard from the Father, all who have learned from the Father, come to Christ. So when the Father opens the heart, the Son is inevitably the one who is worshipped. And again, we don't have to belabor this point, uh, but in a pluralistic society, it's helpful to remember that there is no salvation apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. It is fashionable in some circles. It, try to figure out some way in which we can understand people getting saved through some other means than Christ. Because after all, what do we make of those who don't believe in Christ, but they're sincere Buddhists or Hindus or, or what have you? Uh, this is, I think, the one fatal flaw in C.S. Lewis' marvelous book, The Last Battle, The Conclusion of the Chronicles of Narnia, when he wrestles through this concept of uh, of entering into Aslan's country having served not Aslan. And, and I think Lewis fails there. Everything else I just love about that book, his picture of heaven. But, but this is a difficult thing. What do we make of people who are religious and who seem to have some sort of love for God, but no love for Christ? And to that, we would simply answer, everyone who has genuinely heard, genuinely learned from the Father, comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if Christ is not worshipped, the Father has not drawn. Okay, so this is the, the matter of unbelief. We see it expounded here, we see it explained, expressed, and we even see it defeated by the Father so what is Jesus going to do now? It's impossible to come to him unless the Father draws. So is he just going to sit and do nothing? Is he going to say, this has to happen by the hand of God. There's nothing I can do. So I'm just going to shut up and go home and hope the Father does his work. That's not what he does. Instead, what he does is he proclaims the glories of his deity. He proclaims the gospel. He proclaims the excellencies of himself, beginning in verse 46. And here's how he does this. First, he, in verse 46, he uh, proclaims his heavenly origin. And origin is a bad word here, so don't stretch it, okay? Jesus had no origin. Uh, I get that, but he, he comes from heaven. And so we're talking about a heavenly origin as opposed to an earthly Mary and Joseph sort of purely human origin. So, verse 46, not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Jesus is a man, but he is, he is divine, and his deity and his humanity exist, coexist without any mixture, without any confusion. His humanity is, is normal. Uh, that is, he's a, he's a normal man, without sin, but his deity is entirely unique to himself. Jesus is man, but he is, of course, more than a man. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. And so Jesus' origins are heavenly, not merely earthly. Jesus dwells in the presence of the Father. This is amazing. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Now here's, here's some of what the implications are that Jesus has seen the face of the Father. First of all, it means that Jesus is holy, that he is holy. God says you can't see my face and live. Why? Because the holiness of God consumes sinful humanity. But Jesus has dwelt in the face of the Father because he is holy. Therefore, we know that he is pleasing to the Father. No one comes into the father's presence and lives except he with whom the father is well pleased he who is holy and so jesus is holy as the father is holy and he is pleasing to the father 
And thirdly, what this means is that since Jesus has seen the presence of the Father, he has lived in the presence of the Father, to see Jesus is to, in fact, see the Father. Let me give you an example of that from the book of Exodus. Moses de desires greatly to see the glory of God. And you remember the story where God hides Moses in the cleft of the rock and causes the, the backside of his glory to pass by Moses. And when Moses leaves and goes back to the children of, of Israel, the Israelites, remember, the, his face was glowing. And, and, and so they made him put a sheet over his face. Because when Moses saw the Father, he, he walked out of that presence, and anyone who saw Moses saw something of the glory of God on his face. Now, if that's true for Moses, who uh, spent perhaps two minutes in the presence of the backside of the glory of God, sheltered by a giant rock, can you imagine what that was like in the person of the Lord Jesus, who dwelt with the Father from eternity past. Or Jesus is going to say it this way to Philip in John 14, 9, He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? So when Jesus says, not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God, he has seen the Father, he is telling us that to see him is to see the Father. And so, Jesus proclaims to unbelief his heavenly origin. Then he proclaims his divine power. And here's what we mean by that. Jesus does what only God can do. Verse 47, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Jesus is the distributor of eternal life. This, of course, speaks to the creative ability of Christ, the ability to fill a person with life that never expires. And our nature longs for this. You want this. I want this. We want to live forever. That's why we try to keep our life as long as we can through whatever means are available to us. And it's a good desire. Though it can be twisted into something sinful, Jesus is going to say whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. And so that good desire to, to remain alive can work against us uh, when God would have us to give our lives to him. And, but that desire for eternal life, that desire to live forever, can only be satisfied by the Lord Jesus. But we can't actually believe until the Father opens our eyes to the glory and the power of Christ. Secondly, Jesus not only gives what only God can give, he demands what God, only God can demand. And it is only God that can demand complete and utter dependence. He who believes has eternal life. God demands complete and utter dependence. And God, you know, is not very keen upon us trusting in anything else, ourselves or chariots, horses, etc., Perhaps you could think of Gideon, who mustered up an army and God said, it's too big, and pared it down, pared it down until it was just 300 guys with some pitchers and torches and trumpets. And God said, okay, now you're ready to go to battle. Now we'll see if you can trust me. Uh, David going to meet Goliath, uh, King Jehoshaphat in the face of a mighty army, Zedekiah in the face of the Babylonians. The Old Testament is filled with accounts of God asking his people to go up against insurmountable odds and just trust me that I'll take care of you. And here Jesus is asking us to go up against an insurmountable challenge, the challenge of the grave. Death is the enemy here. He's asking us to walk into death, trusting that he will defeat it for us when we get there. And only God can demand this sort of complete and utter dependence. Now, one of the reasons that God tells us about the fear of Hezekiah when facing 185,000 savage Assyrians and, and God's miraculous rescue of of Hezekiah and his uh, sending of an angel to slaughter the enemy. Hezekiah didn't even have to fight. God tells us that to help us understand that 
when we face the reality of death, we face it with the promise and the assurance that he will be there with us in that moment to help us. And Jesus asked that we put that kind of faith in him, which, if Jesus is not God, is frankly complete and utter blasphemy and destruction of the soul. Finally, Jesus talks about his eternal sacrifice. His eternal sacrifice in verse 48 to 51. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Belief is more than just embracing the reality of Jesus. It's, it's also embracing the reality of sin, specifically my sin. It's embracing the reality of the holiness of God and the utter incompatibility of my sin and God's holiness. Sin must be cleansed, it must be removed, since penalty must be paid, and I can't do that. Now Jesus could make bread fall from heaven, manna style, uh, like he indicates in verse 49, your fathers ate that stuff. Uh, but that bread, while it was good and it was free, ultimately saves nobody. I assume that manna is organic, non-GMO, probably as good and healthy of food as you could possibly get. Jesus knows what your body needs, right? God knows what food is perfect. And yet they ate that and they died. There's no ultimate salvation through diet. We need more than bread to give us life. Jesus is far less interested in giving us bread than he is in giving us himself. If, if you don't get that from John 6, you've missed the point. Jesus would, in fact, rather we be missing arms and legs and arrive in heaven than be perfectly healthy and cast into hell to import something he said from Matthew. I assume that Jesus would rather we starve to death, though there's other places where that's obviously a concern for him. It's just not the concern. Jesus would probably rather we starve to death than go to hell with a full belly. There's another kind of bread that he is interested in us receiving, and that is the bread of life. There is no life for sinners apart from the death of a non-sinner. No sinner can pay for a single sin. Only the sinless inherit eternal life. Only the perfect standing in place of the sinner can remove sin. And so here, especially in verse 51, is a preview of the cross and how we should understand that great and tragic and wonderful and horrible event. I bet it's hard to reconcile in your mind the doctrine of election God draws some, he doesn't draw all. It's just as hard to reconcile the cross, the sinless Son of God dying, the death I deserved, suffering the wrath of God for my sin, purchasing eternal life for me. I think it's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus says, the bread I'll give for the life of the world is my flesh, Jesus' spirit didn't die on the cross. God didn't die on the cross. Jesus committed his spirit into the Father's hands when his body expired. Sometimes we could minimize our physical makeup as if God is only interested in our spiritual self. That comes from Plato and that dualistic view of things that inevitably winds up saying, Physical is bad, spiritual is good, try to get out of the physical, and that leads to all sorts of uh, abuses and weird things. Uh, like Colossians 2.23, these are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. There was a fad that ran through the early church where people would climb up on top of a pole and just sit there, sometimes for years they were called 
ecclesiastical pole sitters, or that's what my church history professor called them. They just sit up there, and they, they thought they were so holy, beating the snot out of their body. And Paul says we can't do that. We shouldn't minimize our physical makeup. Jesus, after all, took on flesh, and the bread he gave for the life of the world is his flesh. Or we could fall on fall off the other side of that horse and maximize our physical makeup as if God's primary concern was keeping our bodies alive. And in that moment, we need to remember 1 Timothy 4.8, which says bodily discipline is of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds a promise for the present life and also for the life to come. And we live in this tension between those two worlds, don't we? Uh, the physical and the spiritual. And Jesus is the one who bridged them for us. And in fact, it was the death of Jesus' physical body, which was created in the image of God, was untainted by sin. It was that body which played such a vital role in our redemption. And heaven will, of course, be the full and final and perfect combination and experience of spiritual and physical reality. And heaven belongs to all who are drawn by the Father, who worship at the feet of the Lord Jesus. So this is Jesus, the bread that came down from heaven and gives life to the world. He preached the gospel. He was rejected. How, how does he understand that? How does, how does he make sense of people not caring what he has to say? No one comes to me unless the Father draws him. So what do you do, Jesus? Just shut up and say nothing? No, he just preach the gospel. This is what we do. And the Father will draw Okay, we'll pick up there in two weeks, next Sunday night in Crosby. So Ivan, Pastor Ivan is going to preach up there next week, so 4.30. All right, Father, thank you for this text.